Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Vivek Joshi, your host of the Aftermarket Champions podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome my good friend Siddharth Madhav to be our guest today. Siddharth and I have known each other for, geez, I think like five, six years now, uh, dating back to his previous company, the previous job he was doing. And uh, we've stayed in touch. We've done some work together and we keep trying to do some work together. But he's uh, one of the guys I turn to quite often when I want to kind of bounce some ideas or get a point of view in something that's kind of been uh, thinking, uh, been uh, germinating in the back of my mind. And uh, with that in mind, I thought, you know, he'd be a great guy for us to bring onto our podcast because he always has an interesting point of view. He's seen a lot of the world and I'll explain to, I'll have him explain to you what, how he's seen a lot of the world. And uh, with that, uh, welcome Siddharth. Uh, glad you made it today. Thank you very much for having me on, Vivek. It's an absolute pleasure to be on the podcast, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I know this one's been tricky to schedule, so I'm glad the stars finally aligned and we were able to get it on the books. You know, I've, I've known you for a while, and no, no grass grows under your feet, so that's for sure. So it's good, to, <laughs> good to finally get you in one place. So, so that the way I always start this uh, conversation is, you know, I ask uh, my guests to introduce themselves, a bit of a life story, if you may, uh, and then more importantly, the career arc of how you came to where you are today. So if you don't mind maybe sharing a bit of that with us. Absolutely. Uh, so as you guys know, uh, my name is Siddharth Madhav, and I'm one of the folks that help run the Fernway Group. Uh, Fernway is, a, is based in San Jose, California, New York, and we are investors in what we call industrial technology companies, mostly in the U.S., and we'll get into a little bit of a definition of that, I'm sure, in time. Uh, we're really big believers in this sector. We're big believers in its importance to the economy and society writ large. And we're also very convinced that there's huge opportunities for value creation in industrial technology companies. Uh, before my time at Fernway, I spent the, uh, the better part of a decade and a half at McKinsey and Company. I was a partner in our advanced industries practice. And uh, McKinsey was my professional home and where I got my professional and business education. And I really can't say enough good things about my experience there, which is also something we'll get into in a little bit. Um, as you can probably tell, I grew up in India and I came to the US for college. I was determined to be an academic. I spent about a decade getting a very lengthy education, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in applied physics, engineering and economics. Um, and then I found myself switching gears, changing ambitions. Uh, I think I realized I did not want to be a tenure track academic and McKinsey helped me figure out uh, what I wanted to do. You know, that's quite an interesting story. Uh, you know, if you think about the background you had between economics and then, uh, like you said, you got a business education at McKinsey, you know, what I tell people about firms like McKinsey and where I worked a long time ago at Booz and some of the top firms like Bain and BCG is you get an extraordinarily wide and deep education really, really fast. Uh, my guess is without looking at a background in economics and everything else, you don't exactly naturally grow up in and around manufacturing, but somehow you wound up in that practice. How did that come about? No, you are absolutely correct. Um, I say this often, McKinsey is a fantastic training ground for people with any background, and in particular, my kind of background. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to bounce around offices, geographies, functions, industries, everything from pharmaceuticals to yellow pages to software in South Africa, all true, uh, before I found my home in what I now call industrial technology. And the reason it works so well is there's the apprenticeship model and there's real commitment all around to people's professional development. And, uh, you know, as you know, these firms are, uh, they manufacture, they're, they're the, the great best leaders in the world. And it's no accident they do it because they really are committed to both the apprenticeship model and, uh, you know, people's, professional development. You know, the thing that's unique about those businesses is an incredibly steep learning curve they put you on. Right? Yep. Uh, from the day you walk into the, uh, to the office, 
you're almost always, as we say, billable, which means you're almost always on a client engagement right off the bat. And I don't know about you, but I still distinctly remember uh, many, many moons ago when I joined uh, the consulting firm I was with, I flew to Cleveland where I was based because I was living somewhere else, signed the paperwork in the morning, and then flew to Detroit where I was going to spend the next many months. And my engagement manager picked me up in a cab. And uh, I don't know why that happened, but then literally on the way to the client, I was getting a download on what I was supposed to do. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But I guess as an economics major, for you to transition to building in and around manufacturing, uh, how did that play its, How did that play a role? What, what kind of things did you do? And how do you wind up in the advanced industries practice? Yeah, um, again, none of this stuff is, is preordained, right? There's a lot of serendipity to it. I have many of the same kind of stories that you just told. And it boils down to, I think, finding your home uh, in, a, in an industry you understand amongst people uh, who are on the same wavelength as you and who are even more committed, I'd, I'd say, than, the, uh, than the, the average to that notion of apprenticeship and uh, professional development. And uh, it just so happened that after I bounced around uh, all of these sectors, industries, and so on, um, what we call advanced industries, which we'll get into in some more detail in a moment, uh, just felt uh, like a very natural home for me. There was lots of work to do. There's really great people to work with and uh, lots of opportunities to have an impact and make your mark. And for me, that really was super appealing. And that's really the story of how I've ended up where I have. You know, it's always about people, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I'll, I, you'll probably hear me say that a half dozen times in, in the half hour we have. Yeah. So you wound up in advanced industries practice. That's where our paths crossed uh, because we were fortunate to work with uh, McKinsey. We're now officially a partner, I think, uh, uh, in terms of uh, one of the partner companies that they work with. So we got that uh, commonality there. Uh, in terms of the work you guys did, how did the whole notion of aftermarket and services wound up, uh, wind up in your, on your radar? Yeah, so if I if you if you let me, I'll just step back a minute and you know talk a little bit about what I mean when I talk about advanced industries or industrial sure. technology, sure. and then dive in. So, industrial technology is a broad term my colleagues and I use to describe companies that make stuff that you can pick up, that you can feel, that you can touch and hold in your hand. Um, it's a bit of a catch-all term, and it spans everything from jet bridges that are sold to airports, uh, switchgear equipment that gets sold to utilities and manufacturing companies, and all the way down to electronic components and semiconductors. I suppose you'd need very tiny hands to be able to pick up and feel semiconductors. But there's a through line in that, right, which is making physical stuff, physical stuff that makes the world go round, relatively simple business models, and generally companies that have remained outside of the limelight. And that's a theme we'll come back to, hopefully. Within the sector, we led what we call the Accelerated Performance Transformation Service Line, which is exactly what it sounds like. We're trying to help companies realize big, big improvements in how they're performing in a short period of time. And uh, aftermarket growth, for all the obvious reasons, high quality of revenue, um, relatively sticky business models really makes it to the top of the list of, you know, the Pareto of initiatives that you would drive in order to help help a company actually achieve this accelerated performance transformation. Does that help sort of to situate uh, aftermarket, Vivek? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, the the value that an aftermarket revenue stream or business stream can create for a manufacturer is extraordinarily high. I mean, you talked about the high quality of revenue. I mean, the unsaid part is typically is high margin. Yep. Uh, typically, because there's not that much spending below line, it tends to be high operating uh, margin as well, in addition to gross profit. Uh, and then the sticky part of it in, in, the, model, in the investor's parlance is, you know, uh, recurring revenue, right? The Absolutely right. Is customers keep coming back to you again and again and buying the same thing over and over again. It's recurring purchases. And that to me has been something that I've always thought is extraordinarily valuable for companies. And I think it's good to see that uh, there are people, uh, certainly the McKinsey's of the world who recognize that and are using that as a 
initiative to drive value creation in their, in their clients. So I'm glad to hear that. Now, when you think about the work that you just talked about in terms of uh, the initiatives and the period of where aftermarket falls in, and you and I have talked about this a number of times in the past, but what is the, what is the biggest hurdle that you've seen uh, in terms of getting people in the old in the old job, your clients, and the new job, your portfolio management to kind of get their heads around this opportunity and do something about it? It's a great question. So I'll start with, you know, look, the razor, razor blade model that people will often talk about applies here. It's really, this is the sector where a lot of that got invented. And I think it's a great example of a, an old and really quite successful business model innovation. Having said that, I think um, we have seen a few pitfalls, right, to getting it right. And I put them in perhaps three buckets. The first is um, you have to be quite granular about how you assess your aftermarket opportunity or your aftermarket entitlement, Vivek, I guess that's what you would call it. And it's really important there to not paint with broad brush strokes. Um, There's an executive I know who manages a multi-billion dollar multi-product portfolio who gave me a quite clever heuristic, I think, for this. He manages all of these uh, these products. Each of them has an aftermarket business attached to it. But what he does is he segments his portfolio based on, you know, which equipment has literally lots of physical moving parts in it. And it's a yes, no categorization. And which equipment is process critical or specced in by his customers. So if you can visualize a simple two by two, his aftermarket focus has always tended to be on, you know, the yes, yes grid. And why is that? The first yes gets you to a large addressable aftermarket opportunity, an addressable market. And the second is an attractive aftermarket uh, opportunity. And he was really quite purposeful about uh, going after these opportunities. The, the opposite approach that I've seen is a bit of you know spray and pray. And I don't think that works well because A, it burns a lot of resources internally. And two, it can sometimes cause some friction you know, with your customer and the rest of the ecosystem. So that's number one, being really granular about assessing the opportunity. The second thing I would say is aftermarket revenue, aftermarket growth cannot be an afterthought. Too many businesses, I think, manage it as a lever to make the quarter. You get your flash report at the end of month two, you're behind budget, and suddenly everyone in the company is turning into an aftermarket you know, sales rep. That's just not sustainable, and I don't think in the long run it works. It's only a mere matter of time before a salesperson who's accustomed to going after big whale, big game hunting, they're just going to drop their focus and come back you know, to what they're, they're used to doing. So the second thing I'd say is this is a specialist job. It needs focus. It needs attention. And uh, it needs what I'd call its own operating system. Very few companies do this well enough. And then the third uh, pitfall I've seen is is not incentivizing properly. Uh, You need to train, incentivize, and organize the team separately. Um, You know, people who are used to making up their quarter on the basis of really large orders, you can't ask them to make, you know, pick up pennies from the fountain. That doesn't really work. So it takes a different kind of person and often different kinds of people sitting in a different part of the organization. I've seen some companies innovate on this dimension. They're partnering, they're creating, you know, they're kind of creating an inside out organization so that you can overcome this particular pitfall. But uh, I think there's a lot to be done and a lot to be said on this third pitfall. So again, just to recap, first, you have to be really granular about the opportunity. It can't be an afterthought. And three, you need to incentivize the right behavior and structure the organization appropriately. You know, there's something I want to pick up on the latter two items, right? You talked about being an afterthought and you talked about the incentive. And I actually agree with you on that uh, thing, but I I have a a slightly different take on it in the sense that if you double click on the afterthought part of it 
and uh, you know lay bare some of the stuff that's what bothers me. Uh, the the notion of afterthought has unfortunately resulted in many people and most of these manufacturers not being the right what I would call skill will mix to do what needs to get done in terms of building out a robust business unit, a robust business line. Uh, I'm seeing that more and more in the people I talk to. My customers are obviously by self-selected. They're already making the shift, making the transformation to the right skill will set. Is that something you think is part of the afterthought to forethought transformation, uh, Siddharth? No, I think you're right. I think they're inextricably linked, right? Many of these industrial companies, the, the, the focus of the business is developing the right solution for the customer. You know, this is years and years of design thinking, trying to solve big, hairy problems. The, the really naughty, thorny problems on the aftermarket are quite different, right? It is about making sure you have the right service level, you're able to get stuff on time, get stuff to the right place as quickly as possible. It's just, you're solving very different business problems. And I do think many companies tend to focus on the big problems that get the attention as opposed to the uh, the needs of an aftermarket buyer or a spare part buyer in a customer. You're absolutely right. I do think they're they're inevitably interlinked. So then if you think about the work you guys did at McKinsey prior to that, and this is a great uh, transition or segue to the front way discussion, yep. is, you know, a lot of what McKinsey was doing is, A, not just making the business case why uh, your manufacturing clients needed to make this uh, transition to a services-oriented uh, forethought business, if you may, uh, helping them make the business process and where possible the people improvements and I mean, improvements are wrong with, you know, uh, people changes. Uh, you've then carried that over to your new uh, venture. Uh, what, what do you see in the McKinsey work that you guys think is an opportunity for you in the front way side? Uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. So I think first I'd say uh, there's a whole lot of, you know, process management, change management that is critical to actually building this capability. It's a muscle that doesn't necessarily exist. And it can be everything from rewarding the right behavior, supporting people with scripts, uh, training them appropriately, figuring out almost in an operate, you know, uh, taking a leaf out of a pe people's operating playbook or manufacturing playbook, uh, having five Y sessions where you're actually figuring out, hey, this script worked, this didn't, uh, why was that? This opportunity resulted in something, this did not, why was that? So really doing it a bit differently than you might, um, I'd say, big deal, uh, big deal desk sales. So that's number one. And number two, I do think, um, now just making the sort of switch over to what we're doing here at Fernway, we have opportunities just given we, we have there's capital and capability, which we'll talk about, uh, to actually work with companies to, you know, partner with them to actually build the business as opposed to purely advising them on how to go about doing it. So that is, I think, at least as when we look at it as Fernway, we have an opportunity. We're partnering with companies to say, look, uh, we can bring the capabilities as well as the capital to drive some of this growth together with you. And that gives you the option as well as it removes some of the some of the organizational constraints that you might be facing. You know, one of the things that is clear to me is that there's this notion of arbitrage, if you may, right, in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, you and I have both talked about the fact that in some ways this is uh, this is one of those but obvious kind of opportunities. Yet, comma, many people don't do it. And that organization, that firm, that company that says, you know what, I'm going to go take the lead and do these things is going to go in. Uh, you talked about building muscle. You talked about building capabilities. How is, I mean, again, without exposing trade secrets, how is Frontway going about doing that at both the firm level and at the portfolio level? Yeah, I would say it starts at the portfolio level, right? Obviously, you build out capabilities at, you know, at, at the Fernway level that our portfolio companies need. 
Um, the first step here is, again, like I said, not painting with overly broad brush strokes. Within our portfolio, there are certain companies who have a certain type of aftermarket opportunity, just bringing it back to the aftermarket discussion, and certain others that have different kinds of aftermarket opportunities. So first, I think, is recognizing those differences and really walking in the shoes of the team that has tried to build, uh, build these businesses and understanding what works and what doesn't. Uh, the second thing that we do is oftentimes we will uh, take the effort to carve out people, uh, the right, right people, carve out the right um, systems, as well as supplement that you know, carved out organization, that carved out group with the right capabilities and capital. To, to drive it. And that might mean, you know, different incentives. It's a, it's a whole host of things. But obviously, within our portfolio, uh, we have many more degrees of freedom to actually be able to do that. We've also been experimenting with doing this together with, with other companies, right, where we can enter into a joint venture that is really focused on parts and services. This is one we've recently announced um, with a very large industrial company. And those are sorts of models that allow us to, at least in our view, address some of the pitfalls we talked about a little while ago. Yep, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I've always uh, considered uh, in the years that I've known you is that there is a, a combination of intellect, which is thinking through and kind of coming up with some really fancy thoughts and then really being able to execute on this stuff, right? Uh, obviously, the front way bet that you guys made, you and your partners who co-founded the firm, made the bet that you're going to go from an advisor to, uh, I think, uh, owner operator is the wrong word, but I think in, involved operator, there, there's a unique word that you guys use for that, which is really focusing on execution as much as anything else. Um, are you Are you realizing that when you get into the nitty gritty of execution, the granular stuff that you talked about, the advice that leading firms of McKinsey, Bain, BCG do uh, versus the, the tactical stuff that needs to get done, there's a vast gulf in that, in this, especially the aftermarket area, or uh, is that bridge not being too bad for you guys to, to, to cross? Uh, it's a great question, and you might be trying to get me in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> so let, let me... I won't, skirt the, I won't skirt the question, but first, let me say, you're absolutely right. First and foremost, very simply put, what we're trying to do at Fernway is we're trying to taste, we're eating our own cooking, right? Uh, we have to get all of the things that we just talked about, if not all, most of them right, in order for us to be successful, in order for our investors to be successful, in order for our companies to be successful. It's very early days, but I think the signs are quite promising. Um, these are capabilities that we are trying to embed in these companies and that's critical for their success. But the ability for us to do that is also critical for us in attracting what I call, think of as the next generation of companies that will be part of the Fernway family, right? Management teams want to be involved with investors, owners who can help them be better. And like we said at the you know top of the call, um, driving aftermarket growth is really, really high up on the list of things people want to be able to do, right? Um, and so really there's nothing better than that. Having said that, I do think, you know, I caution myself, I caution our teams and we're very cognizant of the need to be humble here. There's first the thing you just talked about. I wouldn't call it a, you know, gulf between sort of recommendation and the nitty gritty of execution. But it's more, I think the iceberg analogy is more apt. The recommendations are usually right, but there's a whole host of things that are below the water line that are just as important in order to actually get things done and get to the right outcomes. So for me, it is being more and more conscious of the need to uh, account for all of the, the nitty gritty, the minutia, if you will, um, of execution that you need to get right in order for, you know, for the, for us to be able to get the sort of outcomes we're talking about. That's point number one. Um, the second thing, just on, you know, this point of being humble, there's a tremendous amount of change that's afoot right now. So you, I mean, there's obviously, 
you have the saturation of, of some of these markets. There are customers that are now moving into a different phase of their life cycle in terms of what they're buying from these industrial companies. And you have to be aware of it. At the same time, you're getting hit with all kinds of you know, technology disruption, machine learning models, LLMs, uh, and so on and so forth that are both enabling but also challenging you know, what all of us are doing. So it's really quite important to be humble. You have to keep both, both eyes on the here and the now, and then you need to have a third eye to look further out. And of course, nobody has three eyes, and that's where people like you, uh, Vivek, come in, right? You've got to help portfolio, industrial companies really anticipate what's coming down the pike. Yeah, and I think I was I was not trying to bait you into a wrong answer. I think what I what I was trying to get to is that there's what you said the the iceberg analogy is actually a really good one because uh, directionally, uh, uh, practically, et cetera, et cetera, the the recommendations and the work that the, the folks like McKinsey do is generally actually right on spot. Uh, the difference is when you get to execution, you realize that there's so much more to get done below the surface of the water. That uh, you know, a typical management consultant won't sleep because they, you know, unless there's these long-standing engagements, they're after the next study, next engagement, and so on and so forth. And I think that is a point. And I think there is a secret sauce to what you guys are doing, which is being reasonably involved. I think uh, involved operators. I think that's what you describe yourself as involved operators to kind of help these companies realize the value of what's what they're sitting on. And I know the early results that you mentioned to me recently indicate that that uh, that strategy and that idea works. Now. You know, there's there's a couple of things that come to mind when I think about your McKinsey experience in our firm way as it relates to what I would call broadly speaking, the industrial market. So, so that if I were to say to you, ask you, you know, what would you give a an aftermarket leader or a CEO for that matter of a mid-sized industrial company who neither has the ability to or has thought about bringing somebody like a McKinsey in or does not have the the, the, the good fortune of having a friend way involved with them. What would your advice be for them in terms of, ex, you know, extracting value from the existing franchise they have in the context of the things we talked about, which is really whole notion of aftermarket installed based service and so on. What would those things be as a way to crystallize your last 15, 20 years of uh, experience here? It's a great question. Just before I answer that, I should put in a plug for what we call the engaged investor engaged operator investors. model. Sorry, no, 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 no. That's our idea because we want to be engaged in every facet of these of these of the businesses we own or the businesses we help. Uh, we're obviously investing, and we want to take the operator mindset because that, for me, encompasses everything that we talked about being below the 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 water line. Um, to the question you asked about, you know. What, what advice I might have for, for leaders looking at this. Uh, first, you know, I'll be, I won't presume to be able to offer advice, but maybe some observations or thoughts, right? The first is, as we just talked about a little while ago, there is a quite heavy lift and a different DNA for driving uh, parts and services growth, aftermarket growth, and so on. The, the size of the prize makes it very much worth it, but it does take first, I think, a recognition that you know, what made you successful in one side of the business is not necessarily going to make you successful in the other side of the business. Now, what that means is, I think for some certain larger companies, it is conceivable that you might be able to reorganize yourself into a very dedicated fighting force um, focused on, on driving aftermarket growth. But for what I, the kinds of companies that, you know, you and I often run into, Vivek, mid-sized industrial companies, and they are really the, the vast majority, at least here in the US, um, I'd encourage them to be uh, willing to think out of the box. Uh, I referenced earlier, you know, certain uh, more interesting uh, or innovative business models. We've been involved in some of those, where, for instance, you can partner with with folks who have capital, who have capability, or in your case, uh, Vivek Technology, to say, how do we put it together, maybe create a separate entity that has the support of the mothership, but does not have some of the constraints. That's an entity that can be capitalized differently, but much more importantly, it can be peopled and populated differently, and it can be run differently from the mothership, so that you know it can actually 
drive the, the outcomes that we're talking about. So I guess the thing that I've seen work quite well is a willingness to, to innovate and you know, allow yourself to move faster and break things because there is, you should give yourself license to do that in the, I'd say, parts and services side much more than you can or afford to do in the, in the mothership. Great. You know, the one thing that also the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, hard-earned lessons for both you and me is one of the one of the points I've been making to pretty much every one of our customers today and the people we talk to in terms of prospects or considering a solution like Entitle is I always caution them to think about where they are in the transformation journey of this, uh, you know, afterthought to forethought, really focusing on the business and so on and so forth. And, you know, we've built a very simplistic uh, maturity model to kind of help them think through it, uh, think through it as well. Uh, you know, are you in the process, uh, sorry, let me rephrase it, as, as an engaged uh, investor, uh, engaged operator, engaged investor, are you in also considering some form of a maturity framework as you try to get your portfolio companies uh, to a certain type of performance? Uh, and if so, how do you kind of manage that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think... For the you know the range of companies that we own or work with, uh, a they they span the spectrum, right? There are certain if you go back to that uh, the heuristic that I was giving you, there are certain companies where the opportunity is large and attractive, and there are certain companies where the opportunity is large but perhaps less attractive, and so on. I think orthogonal to that is the question you're asking me, which is how far along uh, and how ready are each of these companies to, you know, to, to get after it. I'd say, you know, we're being a little bit more casual and stumbling into, you know, a framework that, um, that allows us to put people on different ends of the spectrum or where they belong on the spectrum. But I would say that, um, t- two thoughts on that. I think that the force ranking of where somebody is or where a company is or where an organization is on that um, spectrum should not lead to deprioritizing this, but it should inform how you go after it, right? So what I would say is if you're a, you know, if you're a really mature company that has shown the ability to drive transformative change, then the approach you might take may be a lot more of, I can build it in-house, I can get it done with the, with the talent and the bench I have. Whereas a company where the transformation is a little bit more in its early stages, you might want to, you know, take advantage of technology partners like yourselves. You might want to take advantage of some of these uh, more innovative structuring models I described earlier. And three, you might need to bring new people in who can be the glue between the technology, um, the the company, and the opportunity. Right? We call them translators, and those people are really quite important to getting it done. Right? Technology can't just solve paper over these cracks. Yep. Yeah, our, our belief always is people process technology, right? They all go together. And, and it's exactly uh, right. Weirdly enough, as a technology company, I always tell people, think of technology last. Sure, technology could help you maybe bridge some of these things and make some things easier, but if you don't have the right people and the right process, you're not just simply not going to get the benefit you want in transforming the company. So, you know, this is great. So now, uh, one, as I wrap up this stuff, uh, first of all, as we, uh, as we get through the half an hour that we spent together, so that's a couple of questions for you, right? Uh, you kind of addressed this early on, but McKinsey being a fantastic learning experience, uh, you know, you and I obviously uh, had different experiences that come to the same, you know, point, if you may, in our uh, in our approaches to uh, to these businesses. What kind of advice would you give uh, somebody new in the career uh, as they think about this, right? And I'll, I'll hearken specifically to people who who I think we should encourage to come into what I would call the industrial domain. And what's the advice you'd give these uh, new and career folks? So here I do not have an original thought to offer, but I can, <laughs> all I can do is pass along the advice I picked up along the way. Right? Um, maybe starting from like the, the, the general purpose to something quite specific. So A, pick the people you enjoy working with people who challenge you and people who support you and just stick with them. That's the first thing, first piece of advice. And it's, it's very obvious, but it's quite easy to miss. 
The second I'd say is really play the long game, um, especially people early in their career should really devote time, energy, and attention to building out the breadth as well as the depth of their skill set before taking on or demanding, you know, bigger opportunity and responsibility. And a related point to that, I'd say, is, you know, whatever your near-term or medium-term goals, I advise people to first, you know, shoulder the responsibility and then expect the recognition of that, um, uh, recognition of that to follow. You know, too many folks, I think, get it backwards. They want to be recognized as, you know, as owners before they take the responsibility of ownership. They want to be recognized as senior folks before they take on the responsibility that comes with that. So I would say, first shoulder the responsibility, then expect the the recognition. And uh, to your point about um, the industrial space, um, I can't do much better than to put in a little plug for a book written by my colleagues, uh, Nick Santana, Masatosh Padi, and Gaurav Batra. Nick is the CEO of Fernway. Um, Asatosh leads McKinsey Americas, and Gaurav runs a our sister company called Aina. They wrote a book called The Titanium Economy. And what it does is it profiles about 30 companies that dot the, the landscape of the US. They pop up in ways that you don't expect in your everyday life. They make the stuff that makes the world go round, like I said earlier. And I'll bet that most people haven't heard of any of them. But these are incredible companies that make incredible product, create incredible jobs where people need them, and actually have made a ton of money for uh, for their shareholders. So I just encourage you guys to go read the book, The Titanium Economy. And actually, that was uh, almost by design and set up for the last part, because I think that's exactly <laughs> the point. It's a, this is a, in the, the industrial economy is incredibly overlooked but incredibly massive. I mean, I always tell people, look, this is a multi-trillion dollar business worldwide, let alone in the US, right? Yep. And you know, those who pay attention to it uh, when nobody's paying attention to it are the ones who are gonna reap the, you know, what I would call the abnormal benefits, abnormal uh, wins, if you may, in the sector. So I'm with you on that one. I'm, I always tell people like, look, sometimes it's good to wind up in these industries nobody's paying attention to because you can quietly go about doing your work and, and get there. And you know, one, one last thing in acknowledgement to your points to early career people. You know, I say the same things to people in our company. We got a, tons of young, uh, new, new and career folks. And I tell them something slightly differently, right? Which is, look, go deliver what you've been sign, signing up to go deliver, right? Media commitments. That's point number one. And when you meet your commitments, you know, you will earn the credibility and flexibility you need for things for in the, further in a career. But if you don't meet your commitments, if you don't do the job you've been hired to do and then some, none of the stuff matters, none of the stuff will work. Right. So I, I kind of give them the advice in a different manner, the, the same kind of advice. So good, good to see that we're at least in a similar mind plane there. So absolutely. Good. Well, Siddharth, this has been fascinating. Uh, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, this has been great learning. I hope we kind of uh, the folks listening to this will get some really good uh, ideas, uh, especially the ones you talked about towards the end, uh, advice to other companies in this sector. But really, it's about being able to understand that, you know, this is a very, very specific thing you need to go do. Be granular. Don't make it an afterthought. And then really focus on the nitty gritty details of how to get this thing done. It really is what's going to separate the the winners from the posers, as the kids would say. Right. So uh, fantastic. Again, thank you very much, uh, Siddharth. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, doing some work together. here. Thank you very much, uh, Vivek. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing and thank you for having me on this uh, conversation. Really had a great time. Awesome. Thanks.